Hello, welcome to St. John's Episcopal Church here in Norman, Oklahoma. I am Deacon James Tyree, and it is wonderful for you to be here today. Let's begin with a collect. Gracious God, you have called Charles Freer Andrews to empty himself after the example of our Savior so that he might proclaim your salvation to the peoples of India and the Pacific Islands. By your Holy Spirit, inspire us like, with like zeal to bring together people of every race and class, that there may be one body and one spirit in Jesus Christ, our Savior, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 23, beginning with the eighth verse. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all students. And call no one your father on earth, for you have one father, the one in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. All who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. Friends, today we are going to talk about Christ's faithful apostle. Peter, you may ask? The apostle and rock upon Je uh, Jesus said uh, he would build the church? No, no, not Peter. What about John, whom Jesus called the beloved? No, not him either. Though we will get to John and his gospel in a little bit. What about the wonderfully named James, the brother of John and close companion of Jesus and the first apostle to be martyred? Is he Christ's faithful apostle, at least for today's discussion? No. No, we are speaking of Charles Freer Andrews, a 20th century uh, Anglican priest, missionary, and advocate for the poor and oppressed populations within the British Empire during colonial times. He was also one of the very closest friends of Mahatma Gandhi, the one, the very one who dubbed Andrews Christ's faithful apostle, saying, perhaps only half joking, that that's what his initials uh, CFA really stood for. Charles Fear Andrews was born in 1871 in Newcastle upon Tyne in England, and by his late teens, he grew to be deeply religious. He was ordained a deacon in 1896 and priest by 1897, and by this time, he was already deeply concerned with social and economic justice for everyone. In the early 1900s, the very early 1900s, he traveled to India to serve as a missionary, and he was appalled by the blatant and rampant racism from colonial Britons uh, toward the native Indians. So, going very much against the tide, this Christian missionary priest actually sought and gained friendships and trust among Indians, whether they were Hindu or Muslim. And then, in January 1914, Andrews was asked to visit South Africa to advocate on behalf of Indians there who were harshly treated in their work. And there he met one Mohandas Gandhi, known better to us as Mahatma Gandhi. Andrews and Gandhi became friends from the very start. In fact, this is how that first encounter went. Andrews immediately approached Gandhi, who had recently been released from prison, and stooped down to touch his feet, a gesture which horrified the Europeans on the quay side. Gandhi later said of his friendship with Andrews, nobody probably knew Charlie Andrews as well as I did. When we met in South Africa, we simply met as brothers and remained as such to the end. Andrews spent the next six weeks with Gandhi, visiting Indian laborers and observing their conditions. He wrote of his time in South Africa, if I go down the street talking, 
with one of my new Indian friends, everyone turns around to have a big stare, and I am buttonholed afterwards by someone who tells me, look here, you know, this really won't do, you know. We don't do these things in this country. On returning to India later that year in 1914, Andrews decided to abandon his role as missionary because he felt that it really wasn't that compatible with the wider mission that he had of the work that he uh, thought he needed to undertake. Now this is interesting, at least I think it is, because often we hear of men and women answering a call to become clergy or to engage in missionary work in order to increase their uh, ministry and their service. But Father Andrews did the opposite. He stepped down from what he was doing, so to speak, to fully serve others and fulfill his Christian obligations. Charles Freer Andrews traveled the globe to other British colonies, including Kenya, Sri Lanka, and Fiji in the South Pacific, where, again, the brutal living conditions and working um, conditions and atmosphere of indentured laborers were just terrible. Andrews joined others in advocating for the abolishment of that system, which actually came to pass in Fiji by 1929. He, visit, he visited Fiji a few years later in 1936 and was relieved to see the improved conditions there. The people there in Fiji, meanwhile, nicknamed him Dina Bandu, which means friend of the poor. Andrews did what he could to improve the lives of the poor and powerless because he saw that as spreading the way and the light of Christ. Gandhi taught, called his dear friend Christ's faithful apostle because, and I'm quoting, he was a model Christian missionary who never proselytized but was always prepared to serve the people of India. And by the way, he always did so, uh, whether through his work or his speech about, about the faith, by meeting people on their terms, being sensitive to how they were and their way of being. Andrew's love and respect for the poor in general and for populations of all kinds and colors in particular is hardly universal today, and it was really rare in his day a century ago. So why was it so easy for him to see that this was and is the way of Christ? To see and love everyone, regardless of class, race, religion, or any other distinction? I don't know. But two aspects that I learned may give insight on that. For one, he really, really loved Jesus Christ and wanted to follow in his footsteps. That's why he was drawn to the Anglican Church, which he was not born into, by the way, and toured becoming a priest and missionary from an early age. Andrews wanted to learn and understand all he could about Jesus and his life and to spread that love and knowledge to others, no matter who they are. And that is why he returned to active missionary work in the mid-1930s, more than 20 years after giving it up, because his love for the church and for what it was supposed to stand for uh, meant as much to him as the fervent social advocacy that he never gave up and always continued to preach. The second thing was his deep fondness and favor for the Gospel of John. Here's an excerpt from the article, The Legacy of C.F. Andrews by Eric J. Sharp. It reads, at the turn of the century, the commonest missionary alternatives were still the, uh, the Pauline approach or that of the letters of St. Paul with its emphasis on the categories of sin and forgiveness, and the synoptic approach among liberals, where the emphasis was rather on the ethical teaching of Jesus and on the kingdom of God as more of an ideally earthly society. Uh, Andrews found both of these ways of thinking as not wrong, but actually just too narrow. The Gospel of John, though, in particular, the prologue of chapter uh, 1, verses 1 through 14, placed the incarnation of Jesus in a more co uh, cosmic context 
and set their Christian message, or so they believed, I like this right here, largely free from cultural imprisonment. Jesus, his way, the church, the kingdom, is universal regardless of any distinction. It was for all people, for everyone. So as early as 1909, we find Andrews writing that the result, as far as he was concerned, had been to leave behind narrower conceptions and dwell more and more on the thought of Christ as the eternal word, the light, and the life of all mankind. This wider universal appreciation of Jesus crossed all countries and cultures. So why shouldn't he, Andrews thought, and indeed, why shouldn't we today? Amen.